Welcome, RTO superheroes, to another episode of our podcast. Today we have a special episode where the tables are turned. I'm thrilled to introduce our guest, Lauren Hollows. Lauren is an educational visionary and a passionate advocate for building better education systems and services. She is the founder of Anywhere Education Services, and she's dedicated to providing quality, compliant, and accessible assessment tools to educators. With a wealth of experience in business coaching, team development, resource development, and RTO compliance, Lauren excels at identifying ways to improve and streamline processes within the educational sector. She is passionate about using education to make a difference, fostering staff engagement, and enhancing business maturity. Lauren is also the driving force behind Learning Lifelines, a not-for-profit organisation aimed at closing the digital divide and providing equal education and economic opportunities. She believes in the transformative power of education. Today, Lauren will be wearing the interviewer's hat and will be asking me about some of the exciting developments and challenges in the vet sector. So without further ado, let's dive in. Hey guys, this is Lauren Hollis for NOI Education Services, and I'm very fortunate to be continuing our series on assessment for the new RTO standards in our roundtable series with Angela from Vivacity and Marie from Compliance Assist. So guys, we did briefly touch on in our last episode 1.3, which was all about testing. We recommend that you guys go and watch that episode. It'll be linked here, here, somewhere like that. Uh, I'm interested to get into uh, some of the language that they talk about in the principles of assessment rules of evidence, because the actual principles themselves haven't really changed. We've still got the same, the same terms. However, it's interesting to see the way that they've changed or I guess elaborated on what they are, like on how they've, they've described it. So for example, when we have things like you know, fairness, taking into account the learner's need, including reasonable adjustment and where appropriate, enabling reassessment if necessary. Um, I think that some of those like little changes there are quite interesting, particularly when we look at it across different environments. Like when we look at it from a financial perspective, um, if we look at reassessment as an example in the CRIPOS environment, that's often charged at a fee. Um, you know, is there some wiggle room there like what happens when an RTO is not enabling assessment because of the financial needs of the learner does that meet in with the fairness and equity that we've got now very much built into these standards um so just I'd be interested to get your kind of initial thoughts on principles of assessment rules of evidence and some of the specific language that has been brought into those and like you want to kick us off okay thank you uh so when we look at uh, this, the, this standard or this clause in particular, it's, it's foundational in fostering an inclusive learning environment. And I think it ties into some of the other standards that we have, some new ones that we've got, which is um, now we've got disability, uh, we've got First Nations that are also in there, and then we've also got uh, some changes to support services and the th things like that. I think that's where this is going to tie in is with those other new clauses that we have. Um, that's going to be the major change from my perspective uh, and, and much more focus on you know, those rules of evidence and principal assessment and how they do, uh, how you have adjusted your training and assessment in uh, back to what I said in the last episode about your learner cohort and who is defined within your training and assessment strategy. So I think it's it's more of a, okay, how are we end identifying our learners' needs and then adjusting that training and assessment to meet their needs? And I think uh, those other clauses are going to come in uh, that are around support services. So that's my perspective. Absolutely. Marie? Yeah, my, my thoughts on it, Lauren, are the fact that this, in, in, in the previous version of the standard, the standard itself was, you know, simply conduct according to, you know, these rules of evidence and, and principles of assessment. 
This standard now actually is very, and, and then sorry, in the in the previous, you know, it, it was then you go to the um to the guide to see what those you know a definition or a, examples of what those um those particular principles assessment rules of evidence you know actually are or you know, examples of this has now got the actual rules and principles of assessment in the standard itself and for me that is a fairly significant change um so it's actually specifying you know i, I look at 1.4 a three just as an example and it says you know validity so the principle of assessment validity is the assessments of skills and knowledge is integrated with practical application and would enable the learner to demonstrate these skills and knowledge in similar situations whoa straight away that one to me is is a bit very prescriptive in terms of there is an expectation of you know that 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 principle of assessment is really about you know integration of knowledge integration of skills and application in a variety of contexts etc so now the actual principles of assessment are not just a heading of fairness flexibility validity because these words are actually now in the standards themselves so um, that would be what you know you're looking at if you were coming along to audit, not simply um, you know the the information that was user guide. Does does that make some sense? Yeah, and what I'm hearing from both of you is is that obviously, I mean, both of you have spent a lot of time digesting the new standards as a whole, and I think that you know this standard. What I'm hearing from both of you is that kind of with this standard. It's not so much the changes within the particular language of this standard. We think that principles of assessment, rules of evidence, they are what they are. They're integral to our industry. But taking that into account now in terms of the larger standards, in terms of equity and well-being and a, a stronger focus on training and, um, you know, a stronger focus on, like, contextualization and really thinking about and considering learners that's probably more where this particular standard, so, you, you know, your your policy as such might not change, but a, a renewed focus on, for RTOs, on do my tools really meet the needs of my cohort? Do we have processes that allow for that to occur? Um, and then when we then take that to the next point, how do RTOs, you know, have, you know if I'm an RTO, and I'm looking at all of this and I know I've got I've got to be compliant with all of this from 1125. What are some of the pieces of evidence that I'm I need to start collecting? What are some of the process changes that I need to be making in order to account for that? What what are your what's your advice to RTOs who are looking at this and kind of going, okay, but what does that practically mean for me in terms of my assessment tools and things like that? One thing that um, I find very interesting within this, so if we look at uh, 1.4b, assessors make individual assessment judgments that are justified based on the following rules of evidence. This it, It's more of a focus on the assessor now, not just the RTO. The assessment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think there's going to be a lot more responsibility on the assessors when it comes to these these standards now. And I think that's really going to tie in with the workforce development plan and having that in place as well and the responsibility of trainers and assessors when it comes to workforce development. Um, this is actually saying now the assessors are responsible for the assessment judgments, which should have always been that way, but it's actually clarified now within the clause. And, and I think, Angela, that even goes to, you know, 1.4a, mm. that assessment is conducted in a way, not that the assessment system mm. itself, it's, it's that it, it is actually conducted in a way that is consistent with these principles. And more of onus on the assessor. On the actual process, on the practice of it, mm. as opposed to the the um, the tools, the, the um, methods, et cetera. Yeah. Mm. 
And, so, and I think that I think that by putting the words rather than just saying is consistent way with you know with the principles of assessment of fairness of flexibility, I, I think that the, the standard is trying to actually really spell out the interpretation of fairness, the interpretation of flexibility, the mm. interpretation of validity, um, you know, and, and reliability, obviously, um, to go, well, you know, it's it's not a choose your own adventure as to what you think these principles mean. Yeah. Um, here is what we mean by the principle of fairness. Because otherwise, you know, because they put those words into a legislative standard mm. as opposed to previously having it as the principles of assessment and the rules of evidence in the legislative standard and then you have the what does, you know, how are they interpreted in a guide. Mm. Now it's actually saying no, this this is the interpretation of it, um, you know, don't don't come up with your own. Here's, yeah. here's the one that we're giving you. So I'm really interested in how ASCO will interpret this as well yeah. when you write the user guide. Mm. From, I mean, I think it's one of the interesting components just from an operational perspective on this is how, I mean, there has been a separation over the years of compliance and trainers and what their duties are and what their responsibilities are. Do you think that in your, your interpretations of this, one of the focuses for this year for RTOs does need to be looking at having processes where trainers can be more integrated into the design and feedback process um, and also potentially really an upskilling of trainers as well to go back to, you know, helping trainers to really understand their units, to really understand, you know, those, what the principles of assessment are and how that looks and what the rules of assessment, like what the rules of evidence are and how that looks. Um, I mean, in, in my opinion, I, I still think, I mean, I, every year I do a series on the principles of assessment and the rules of evidence and it's because... Every year, it continues to be an area where, you know, trainers come to me and they go, uh, you know, once one side goes, well, I don't really, I still really don't understand this. And then the other side goes, I'm really frustrated because I, I know I have a responsibility on these tools, but I, our processes are such that I actually don't, I can't have any say in. So, you know, how do you, you know, what advice do we give to RTOs and to trainers in those situations to kind of go, well, this is this is kind of going to be a way that you're going to have to negotiate that and you've got the next, you know, 10 months to kind of really bring that in and make some changes to your organisational, you know, structure and, and, you know, culture as to how that's all going to work. Yeah, well, uh, I've been teaching every year I deliver a workshop on assessment validation and explain the rules of evidence and principles of assessment. And it is an area where there is a lot of non-compliance, um, it has been historically. So it's not just trainers and assessors understanding, it's also the RTOs understanding how they work. And the way I explain it is we have our unit of competency, then we have our rules of evidence and principle assessment, and they all layer over each other. And we use the rules of evidence and principle assessment to identify whether we're delivering the unit of competency to meet those requirements. So it's really looking at the unit of competency, breaking down the performance criteria and saying, in our assessment tool, are we valid? Are we reliable? Are we um, meeting the requirements of the rules of evidence and principle assessment? And I think once people see it as it's an overlay, it's not separate, it's an overlay of the uh, performance criteria and the assessment conditions within the unit, then they're able to get a better understanding. And that's how I explain it to trainers and assessors. And I think now moving forward with the new, and you can start doing this now, but moving forward with the news clauses, trainers should be taking that into consideration while they're conducting assessment, training and assessment, and how are they applying that in their uh, delivery of their training as well as conducting their assessments and start thinking about how do, th how do the rules of evidence and principle assessment overlay and interlay into that unit of competency? Marie? Yeah, no, I, I cannot disagree. But And I think it sort of takes a step back into the, in our previous um, session, we were talking about that testing. 
Mm. Um, and that sort of whole concept of, you know, testing, uh, you know, and, and I think that that sort of talks to it as well. You've got to understand what the principles are. You've got to understand what the rules of evidence are. You've got to understand what the actual requirements of the training package are in order that you can go, well, is this going to work? Is this going to make sure that, you know, um, the evidence I collect is is going to, to be, you know, um, what I need it to be or the, the, you know, it's being done in such a way that, you know, it, it's fair and it's equitable and it's flexible and all the rest of it and, and can I be flexible? And I think that, you know, that whole testing process is really is so critical to this process um, and, you know, the number of times, to be honest, I've picked up an assessment at an RTO and thought, I haven't got the first clue what it is I'm supposed to be doing. Um, oh, how, you know, as a learner, so you know, put my I like to put my learners, you know, shoes on and go. Well, I, I can't work out what I'm. What am I supposed to be doing? Or how on earth am I going to do that? Or um, and then I put my assessor's hat on and go. I can't figure it out either. I can't conduct it. Yeah. 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 So so how on earth can I conduct it? And then, you know, Lauren, the point that you were making is that business about um you know, we've we've tested these tools because you know 1.3 is about testing the tools and it specifically says tools. And then we come down to 1.4 where we're actually talking about conducting the assessment. And, you know, again, this is one of the things that comes up repeatedly, you know, the assessor who you go, well, hang on a minute, um, but this tool says this, but you've done something completely different. Oh, yeah, that didn't work. You know, I couldn't get that to work or, you know, they couldn't understand, you know, whatever. So so making that consistency between them as well and, and assessors understanding that you're going to be conducting this, can you? Um, you know, you know you learn it. You know, can you actually do this? Because if not, we, we need to step back to 1.3 again um, and, and go, well, hey, this doesn't work. It doesn't achieve what I need it to achieve. But you're not authorised to just go ahead and just, you know, um, do, you choose your own adventure and do it yourself. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think that, you know, again, this is an area that has always been problematic and I, I'm not sure how much it's improving, to be honest. Mm. Yes, it will be uh, very interesting to see how we're going to be audited against mm -hmm. against this and what, what will be different. Um, it was interesting, Lauren and I at the last Avel conference uh, actually spoke to uh, some of the auditors, the ASFA auditors, and they didn't know what how they were going to interpret it because uh, they had actually, the people that we spoke to said it's so ambiguous uh, all of the standards, they don't know how they're going to be auditing against them. Um, particularly, so a lot of the changes in the standards was to uh, break it down for big and small RTOs. So it's ambiguous because of that, because it's going to be different for, for a different size RTO. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Um, I think it's, it's going to be more of an onus on the trainer and assessor to be taking into consideration what are the rules of evidence and principle assessment, not just on the RTO. Um, I think it's it's the trainers really thinking about um, how am I applying the rules of evidence and principle assessment whilst I'm delivering my training. It's going to be, instead of just validation, we're validating and we're integrating, it should be in their day-to-day -day delivery of their training and assessment. How am I applying this? Thank you for joining us at the RTO Superhero Podcast with me, Angela Connell Richards. Please take a moment to rate and review the podcast on your preferred podcast app. Each rating and review helps me fulfil my goal of helping training organisations around Australia to learn and grow in compliance and business success.